just over 30 years as the owner of the Casbah here in San Diego, correct? Yep, in our 31st year right now, actually. Have you been through crazier times? Never. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, never. I mean, there's, there's been ups and downs over the years, but, you know, it's been uh, pretty much an upward arc. Steadily, you know, especially the last few years have been really great. Right. Um, I think the last time we had any difficulty, I mean, we've never had to close for any period of time, but last time we were, you know, in a financial strait similar to this was in 2008 when there was the, you know, the huge, uh, uh, economic crisis and meltdown and all the big banks and all that mortgages. Right. But that was, that lasted a couple months, you know, um, and prior to that, I can't, you know, it's like I said, up and down. Right now, we're going on two months of being closed, and, you know, who knows when we'll be able to reopen at any capacity, much less full capacity. Right. I'm really sorry to hear that. We're touching base with different venues around town. Just to really kind of check in and see if there's any way that we can help. You know, I'm looking at the different stages here. I'm I'm sure you're very familiar with the four stage plan here in California, right? Oh yeah, 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 the, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we're at the very end of phase four, if that. Yeah, I could imagine the phase five being for bars and nightclubs, especially ones that are general admission. You know, like what we do, and like what most smaller clubs do, where you can't, you know, you don't have seating, fixed seating that you can block out for for uh, safe distancing and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, I, I, I pay pretty close attention to all the guidelines and regulations. You think that small venues here locally are definitely phase four? Yeah. What I, what I read yesterday is if you say you are a bar or nightclub that serves food, you can possibly reopen sometime soon. Right. But you have to serve sit-down meals and alcohol can only be ordered at the same time as you order a sit-down meal. So, you know, I'm not sure how that translates into a venue that doesn't serve food, even if we brought in like a, you know, a a food truck or a, uh, say, a a vendor on our patio or something that was serving serving meals. Yeah, and for the live music aspect, there'd have to be seating of some sort, right? Maybe lounge seating, or have you thought of any... (laughs) loopholes around that to open up sooner? I'm not going to open until I I think it's safe for my staff, our performers and the audience and right. and when people feel comfortable coming back out. And uh, when we do are able to reopen it'll be with a reduced capacity, I'm sure, and we are looking at plans of putting in actual, you know, tables and stools or chairs to distance people and and keep people, you know, separated. Uh, which, you know, obviously our capacity is already reduced, so it's going to make it difficult. You know, who, who knows? I mean, there's, there, there's, it's real hard because I've talked to a lot of different bands that are eager to get out and play, even at smaller capacity, maybe doing two or three nights in a row. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's hard to really formulate a solid plan because we don't know when we can do that. We want to start streaming live shows from the club as soon as we get the okay to say have gatherings of maybe up to 10 people so we can have a band come in and and, and perform with a with a skeleton crew of a sound man and a video person uh that we could stream we've set up a live youtube and twitch channels to facilitate that we we're, we're working on a a camera system so that we can record and, and you know stream stuff but again we don't have any clue as to when we can even do that Right. So it's, 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 you know, it's just to kind of wait and see it, see if they want to, you know, brainstorm with other friends who go in clubs and musicians to try and figure out things we can do in the meantime. But, you know, there's not a whole lot that right. can take the place of live music. Right. I did see you do some live video from the Casbah. It was good to see you in there. And then I do know that you're doing Seaport Session live streams. You're a part of that in some way, correct? Yes, we're doing that. Now, that that's something we started. My Casbah and Vinyl Junkies, my record shop, we started doing the Seaport Sessions last August. And they were live once a week shows down at Seaport Village. Uh, the Port District is uh, generously 
funding these events. And then when, uh, you know, all this stuff hit in March, we decided to try and keep it going, but just doing it once a month and doing it as a live stream. Uh, and it's turned out to where it's going to be, it's being pre-recorded streams right. just because, you know, we can't get a full band together to, to do it uh, as a live stream with the crew and everything. So they've been fairly successful. I mean, we get, we're getting decent viewership. The next one, will be May twenty first with Donkeys and Paul Jenkins. Right. And each of those each of those artists recorded pre recorded their stuff and edited it and it'll just go out over the Seaport mm-hmm. uh, Village Facebook page. It came out really good and it's hosted by Tim Piles, obviously. He kind of connected you and I. Um yep. I tuned in last time. You had the schizophonics and you had low volts. That was really cool. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Uh, the only the only issue with it has been the, the video, uh, the stream dropping, you know, which which right. I'm not sure we haven't figured out out yet. I think it's a bandwidth issue, but uh, yeah, the performances are really cool and they're inventive. And I guess the donkeys are doing really some, something really cool because there's four guys in the band and they're all doing separate stuff, but kind of editing it together to appear as one perform as all performing the same song. Awesome. And then uh, Paul did some really cool stuff down at the Seaport Village studio the other day. So That's cool, man. yeah, it's going to be good. We're doing another one in June and you know, they're wait- we're waiting to see what their fiscal year of uh, 2021, which starts July 1st brings. Hopefully we can keep that going. And then, you know, when it's, safe to do so we can go back to doing them live down at uh, seaboard village right it's really cool to see how musicians are staying creative during this time huh with the live stream and obviously everything you guys are doing oh yeah i mean you know everybody's uh, you're seeing people you know record in their garages or their houses or their basements and, totally you know it's it's cool to see what you know life is like for people and we're actually looking at taking this the whole the live stream thing is great but then trying to do some other things with some other local musicians who uh, to get a glimpse of what their lives are like outside of playing on a stage. There you go. And so we're going to try and incorporate some of that stuff once we're able to do some live streaming stuff. I love that. I, I get the feeling it's giving musicians new ideas. Like this could start a permanent trend. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, people are definitely looking at ways to adapt, you know, because things aren't going to get back to where they were two months ago for at least a year, probably where people feel safe of, you know, cramming 200 people into a club uh, right up against the stage. So musicians are being aware of that and still trying to get their music out there and also make a living, uh, you know, or, or doing whatever they can, whether it's releasing music or, or live streaming or, or, you know, putting up archived stuff that they've got already in the can, you know, there's anything that anything, I mean, it's like, try it all. Why not? You know, absolutely. Let's talk about the, the history of the Casbah, man. Uh, you first opened in 89 with, uh, Bob Bennett and Peter English, correct? Over on Kettner Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. We're still on Kettner, just about uh, two blocks up where Kava Lounge is today. And that was in 89, and then we moved into our current location in January 94. 94. And it's been uh, ever since. Here we are. You know, it keeps going. And we've got a really great dedicated staff that uh, a lot of them have been there for 15, 20 years, maybe long, a couple of them longer than that. And, uh, you know, we've been able and to cultivate relationships with, with local musicians and, and touring musicians that right. come through and, you know, the touring bands play there when they're starting out and then get bigger. And, and when they get bigger, we'll book them into other rooms that we have relationships with as well. Like, uh, you know, belly up or observatory or, or the music box or, or what, what have you, you know? So we've been, we've been fortunate that we've been able to maintain these relationships and that's what's kept us going for all these years, you know, just, uh, I think our philosophy has always been uh, just treat treat everybody with respect. Uh, treat people the way you'd want to be treated. Right. If you were stepping into a club, whether it's as a musician or a fan, and the staff, you know, the staff is is taken care of too, and right. it's a it's kind of a, like a big family operation over there with the, the way people work together. Absolutely. What motivated you to open a venue? Were were you a musician? Are you a musician? 
No, well, I was a, 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 a wannabe musician back when I was, <laughs> you know, junior high and high school. You know, I yeah. I tried to play guitar and stuff to, you know, not great success. I was never in a band, but I was a music fan. I always used to go to concerts. And I, huh. I first started putting on punk rock shows in 1980 wow. uh, with like bands like Circle Jerks, Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, wow. English bands like GBH and UK Subs. And then uh, opened a bar before the Casbah. Peter and Bob and I opened a place called the Pink Panther yeah. on Morena Boulevard. Yeah. And that was just a bar for young people with a jukebox, and we had DJs. And that became really successful. It was like the first first bar owned by young people for young people. Right. So it wasn't like an old man bar with a crappy jukebox. It was a really cool bar with a great jukebox. And that kind of... I, at that point I stopped putting on shows for a few years mm. and then we decided to buy, buy a place where we could do live music because Peter had a, a background in live music as well. He, he used to run a place called King's road on 30th, which is I think around where tornado is or was right now. Okay. So we bought, we bought this place called the harp and shamrock and turned it into the Casbah mm. and, uh, started doing shows. Wow. And people started reaching out again that I had worked with during the punk rock days, started, you know, approaching us about touring bands again. So we just started doing that. And then in 90, 1990, into 91, that's when the big local music scene exploded. And that right after Nirvana got huge. So everybody was looking for the next Nirvana. And tons of bands, local bands got signed and they all played at the Casbah. And it was like they were all from the Casbah. And it was a pretty, pretty great, healthy scene. And, you know, that kind of spawned what we've been doing ever since. That's amazing. You've hosted San Diego bands like Rocket from the Crypt, Lucy's for Coat, Truman's Water, uh, Deadbolt, so many others. You mentioned Nirvana, and uh, I was reading up Nirvana and the Smashing Pumpkins played at the Casbah, correct? Yeah, they played at the old location, which uh, legal capacity of 75 people. 75. Um, we used to cram a lot more people in there than that. But uh, <laughs> they both played there within a couple months of each other. I I missed the Nirvana show. I was out of town. Okay. And I did see the Smashing Pumpkins show, though. And it was fantastic. Both both shows are crazy. There's there's a, definitely some bootleg tapes of the Nirvana show out there wow. um, that I've come across every every now and then on you know somebody will post something on facebook or something so wow. but yeah those were those were both early before each either band got you know obviously way huger yeah and uh yeah we did so many bands like that over the years you know like into the new casbah then like with the white stripes the black keys and death cab for cutie and like social distortion and uh, so many others over the years that I can't even I can't even remember who they are at this point. Right, right. I have to look at a spreadsheet to remind <laughs> me. <laughs> That's so cool, man. I mean, such a legendary, legendary venue here in San Diego, the Casbah. Does Eddie Vedder have any ties with the Casbah, or is that misinformation? Well, you know, he <laughs> he used to come there. He came there a couple times to see Jonathan Richmond. Right. And his wife's band, Hovercraft, played there back when he was married. Uh, this is going back in the, I can't remember, maybe the 2000s, early 2000s. And okay. He and I played a game of pool once uh, after after the club closed. Uh, we were hanging around having some drinks. And he and I played pool for rights to own the club. And he, he beat me <laughs> pretty, pretty handily. He was a really good pool player. And uh, he beat me. And... You know, it was a, a friendly bet. Nothing that you know. I had bet the Casbah versus his future royalties. So <laughs> you know, if, if I had won, I might have tried to collect. But I heard a rumor months later that Eddie Vedder owned the Casbah, and I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> and then I remembered, "Oh yeah, that we had that pool game." And apparently, he had been on the air up in uh, Seattle with uh, I think Marco Collins, who's from San Diego, and they were talking about San Diego, and Eddie talked about winning the Casbah in a pool game. And so the rumor, this was pre-internet time. 
the rumor just kind of started filtering down the coast and that's that's how i heard about it from somebody who asked me so wow. you know luckily he's never he's never stopped to cl- stopped in to claim his uh ownership but uh <laughs> anytime he does come around we'll treat him like an owner <laughs> wow that is so cool you, you almost got all the royalties too for uh for pearl jam that would have been nice oh man yeah right Crazy. Yeah, I'd still be getting checks on that. Have you ever been starstruck by someone walking through the door at the Casbah? Um, you know, let me think back. Uh, there's been a few people over there over the years. Like uh, Billy Gibbons showed up one night, and I wow. remember it was it was I forget. I think he came to see uh, Hank Williams the right. third, and he showed up and he was walking up, and he's a short guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're, I'm standing out for, front with a couple of friends, and we see this guy walking up. We go, "Well, who's this Billy Gibbons wannabe looking like, dude?" You know, <laughs> we're like, "What? What's up with this guy?" You know. So he goes in. He's very, you know, polite demeanor at the door. Yeah. Goes in, and then somebody else we know comes out a little while later and says, "Man, I was just talking to Billy Gibbons in there." And we're like, "Oh wow, okay, it really is Billy Gibbons." Wow. Um, Jack Black has been there in the past. He uh-huh. came to, came in to see urge overkill um and hung out he was good friends with those guys and oh. i got a photo with him out front which i've never been able to find <laughs> and as far as bands and being starstruck i mean it's really hard to say i mean there's definitely been some performers there that i would never have thought would play there like well i think uh recently and this is uh, a band that is no longer because the the guitar player just recently died, but Gang of Four okay. played there. And granted, it was only the only original member was the guitar player, and with three three younger guys filling in. But I was pretty starstruck then because they were one of my favorite bands back in the eighties, and the guitar player was still just as great as ever. I mean, he passed away a few months later. Um, gotcha. Some other ones, some of the old uh, like Link Ray. Or uh, R.L. Burnside, old blues guys. Hubert Sumlin played the Casbah a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, then seeing some bands like, well, back when the, a lot of these bands first played there, they weren't big stars yet. So there was no star strength. Like, I'm going to say White Stripes, you know, Jack White. Right. But back when he played there, he was too young to even be in the club. He had to wait outside. Wow. You know, so so it was more of an equal footing meeting being there and meeting the bands coming through, you know, once in a while you'd get somebody older and legendary, like the, the church played there a few years ago. And that was a pretty big deal, you know, cause they were a huge band and they, they had never played there before. And then, uh, yeah. like, uh, English B with Dave Wakeling, the same kind of thing, you know, I mean, that's a band that I grew up listening to in the eighties and to have him come and play the club and be on the stage was like, okay, that's really cool. And there's been a lot of things, but I don't get too Star Trek. Most of the people, <laughs> luckily, most of the people we've dealt with over all these years have been really, really cool yeah. and down to earth and, you know, very humble. Yeah. And the few that haven't been, you know, well, that's on them. Yeah. Yeah, totally. What are your thoughts on the all ages scene here in San Diego? Do you think Soma has that covered right now? Well, you know, Soma. I, despite Live Nation going in there and, and kind of revamping it and making it nicer, it's still just a big box. Right. And, you know, the, the main room is, is huge, so it doesn't fit. You know, there's a, a big room to a little type place in San Diego of 500 people and has a nice vibe. The small small room at Soma, you know, I mean, you walk in, it's a, it's a converted movie theater. Right. And there's no, there's no charm or aesthetic to the room at all. So I read it had a, a decent aesthetic. You know, it's a shame that, you know, they, they ran into legal difficulties with the city and there's not really anything that's replaced it at that level. I mean, you know, music box can do all ages, yeah. but, uh, it's a, it's a bigger room and mm-hmm. it's fancy. It's a pretty fancy place. Uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the voodoo room at a house of blues, yeah. you know, is not, is not, the, not my favorite. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, something that's needed, but, uh, the, the realities of opening a place are, you know, expensive. Right. 
And right now, probably not the best time, right? No, oh, yeah, well, definitely not right now. <laughs> Nobody's doing anything right now. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I feel really bad for the people, and this is not not venue wise, but restaurants that opened in the last say three or four months, and they're were just getting out of the gate when this whole thing hit, and now they were been shut down because you know I own a restaurant that's been closed for two months too. So what restaurant is that? Starlight. Oh, you own Starlight. Okay. Very cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm a part owner. I, I don't I don't participate in the day to day operation, but right. I've been an owner. We've been there we've been there oh, thirteen years now in June, but you know, it's 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 real difficult uh right. and like especially if you had just opened a place and sunk everything you had into it. And now you got nothing coming in, man. It's like a feel for those people. Yeah, there's a Texas steakhouse. I live in El Cajon right down the street from me that just had their grand opening. And all they can do is the curbside pickup. So, uh, yeah, I sympathize. Yeah, yeah. And that, that doesn't cut, that doesn't pay the bills, really. No. Yeah, at Starlight, at Starlight, we're not even doing that because just to run our kitchen is, a, you know, it's a certain expense that we couldn't yeah. match doing curbside takeout foods, you know? Yeah. Are you associated with any other music venues in San Diego? I think you have some ties with Soda Bar, right? Yeah, I'm part owner at Soda Bar. Um, We're going to chat with Corey here next. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Corey and I, Corey does most of the booking and I do a lot. I was doing booking over there already before we we bought the place together. Cool. So I still do booking there. I mean, we're we're pretty much in the same boat over there as Casbah. As we, we just don't have any idea on when or what we can do. Right. So it's kind of just a, a big holding pattern, you know, like if we're <laughs> flying around an airport waiting to land and hopefully we don't run out of fuel. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good analogy. Um, anything we can do to help the Casbah or the soda bar, the music scene? Well, you know, we, we've both been doing, both clubs have been doing a lot of merch stuff online with different lines of merch and, and different ideas and, and money's benefiting staff and the venues. Uh, right now that's the main support we can do. I mean, okay. we've got, uh, new lines of stuff coming out all the time. We just did a custom color merch sale at Casbah that did really well. And before awesome. that we did a sale in, in right in, in early March to benefit our employees and we raised, you know, many, many thousands of dollars for our staff. So, you know, and then and, and people I think will be we get outpourings of support on our on our Facebook page and Instagram stuff all the time, and just keep us in your minds. And you know, when we're ready to go, and if there's a live stream and you want to watch and donate money, there are means ways to do that for uh, both clubs. Absolutely. What is the Casbah's website? Casbahmusic.com and Soda Bar is SodaBarMusic.com. Awesome. And again, uh, Seaport Sessions, live streams every third Thursday of the month. Yeah. So next one will be May 21st. May 21st. Yeah. With uh, the donkey and Paul Jenkins. I look forward to it. Correct. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. Absolutely. Tim Mays, uh, you get a lot of love here locally. I've had Tim Piles on here and he has nothing but great things to say about you. Bart Mendoza has talked to you up quite a bit on here. Uh, thanks for all you've done for the, the music scene. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to, to let people know what's going on. And, you know, Tim Piles and Bart have been there for uh, probably, Bart's been there as long as I can remember too. And Tim is a big part of what we do with Casbah. So right. uh, we appreciate the support and the love from everybody and uh, give it back to people whenever we can. Absolutely, my friend. I wish you the very best, Tim. Thanks, Troy. I'll see you at the Casbah soon, all right, man? Yep. Take care. Yes, sir. Take care. Bye-bye.